Kia ora, and welcome to Without Borders, your fortnightly dose of real people, real conversations, and a little bit of real estate. Hello, I'm William Tartaner of Team William Tartaner at the Ray White Damerel Group. Now, I've had a rich and colourful career in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, and I've met some wonderful people along the way who have contributed and shaped me into the person that I am today. I'd like to share those people with you because we can all learn and be better human beings. Without Borders will inform, educate, and entertain you over 20 minutes. Good people who have a story to share and a lesson to learn. Well, today my guest is Gower Buchanan, who's the CEO and business owner of Ray White Damerel Group. So good morning, Gower, and how are you doing today? Very well, thank you, William. Yeah, good. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure and um, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. No worries. Um, well, welcome to Without Borders. Um, for the sake of the audience, just tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, well, I guess um, I grew up on a sheep and beef farm uh, with uh, my parents in um, Thai Happy. So I've got oh. one of sort of four uh, siblings. And um, yeah, so my parents are still sheep and beef farmers down there. And, uh, you know, I left home, went to boarding school, and um, basically then went to university. And by pure fluke, really found myself in uh, real estate. Um, yeah, and. Um, Sort of the rest is history, I guess. So. Um, where, where did you start off your career in real estate industry? I started in Christchurch. I okay. started studying a law degree down there, and um, then um, actually applied for a job uh, on the back of a bus uh, as a real estate <laughs> cadet. Actually, so um, turns out bus advertising does work. Um, <laughs> I was pretty desperate because turns turns out I'd had a pretty social first year in uh, in, in uh, studying law, and so I sort of thought um, I'd better find a job. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I got a I got a job as a real estate cadet and um and right. then I actually ended up studying my law degree part time and, okay. and finished that. So. Um, how many years were you in uh, real estate uh, uh, as, as a salesperson? I'm uh, so for just on four years as a, as a as a salesperson before I made the move from Christchurch um, up to Auckland. So. What would you uh, obviously from that experience? What would be a couple of learnings? Uh, because there would be people obviously listening to this and thinking mm. about real estate agents. You know what's What's the deal? They just think we just put uh, open home signs out, some uh, some advertising, and it's sold. But it's mm. a lot more than that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, my learnings from from my time in Christchurch were is really centered around you know having a focus for what the customer actually really needs and mm-hmm. what's important, what's really important to them. And I think all the key fundamentals remain the same. You know from. You know, everyone that I've met who's been in real estate for, you know, 20, 30 years or, or just starting out today, I think the fundamentals of good quality communication, you know, being sure. um, open and transparent, um, you know, attracting buyers to to property uh, through, you know, a broad range of marketing and then putting those buyers in competition with one another. I think those sort of – those fundamentals um, that I learned in Christchurch um, still remain true today. So, um, What would be the funniest sale you ever did in that in your time down there? Oh, that's a good one. I, I met a um, – I met – I met – I, obviously, I was pretty young when I first started, so sure. I, I met a lot of sort of parents of mates through, you know, twenty firsts, going to twenty yeah. firsts, and um, I always had to sort of knock off pretty early, um, you know, because I had open homes the next day, right? So, mm-hmm. um, which was probably a good thing, if I'm honest. Um, mm-hmm. But I, um, I met um, a, a mate of mine, his parents, and they were um, they just sold a couple of dairy farms, and so they needed to right. buy some. Um, they needed to buy a couple of rental properties, and so I sort of ended up um, taking them through a number of sort of um, student flats, sort of which okay. ended up being my mate's flats, <laughs> sort of trying to sell sell um, Mr. and Mrs. Whitehead um, a uh, a. Um, Sort of, uh, you know, a couple of investment properties, and I think, you know, I think what I most enjoyed about about that experience was getting to know my, you know, my friends' parents, but but also just the way that they like to negotiate was um, was also was also pretty hard case. So, <laughs> um, and I could see a lot of similarities between uh, Paul and um, and uh, his son James. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think that was sort of um, one of my one of the, one of the experiences that stands out. So, yeah, oh, fantastic. I was, I was pretty privileged to be able to help help. Um, after that, you moved. 
to Auckland, wasn't it? Yeah, that correct? I did. And yep. then what was the attraction to come to Auckland? Um, well, I think for me it was um, – I identified pretty early on that I wanted to own a business. Um, and uh, so I think I started I, – I really started looking around right around the country really for business owners that were thinking about retirement um, because I, I – what I identified in the business that I worked in was that although it was a great business and um, – and the leader, leadership of that business was fantastic. Mm. There was also some areas where someone who'd been in real estate for a wee while, um, but who was also, you know, of the younger demographic might actually be able to add some value. And so I knew I couldn't start a business on my own, um, sure. and I knew I had to go on that journey. Um, and so it was really – it wasn't necessarily about Auckland. It was more about finding the right okay. um, business owners to – to go on that that learning journey that I needed to go on, and 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 from their perspective, going on a succession planning journey. So it was um, it was by pure fluke and pure good luck, and <laughs> uh, that I sort of found myself in Ponsonby to start with, and okay. in Auckland. So um, yeah, it's sort of yeah, hard to believe really, but yeah. um, but I I sort of ended up in what I'd sort of almost term real estate mecca. So. Right. Um, yeah. So when you came and joined the uh, Damerel group, because mm. obviously Simon Damerel was the owner then, mm. um, how did you, what was your process or what was your uh, career path in there? How did that happen? Yeah. So I mean, Simon and Bryce were two of my sort of key mentors. So Bryce Earwaker was also um, also owned the office at, at, at that stage, along with Simon, and um, I think they, you know, they both were. Um, incredibly generous to me and gave me a lot of support and and advice um, and it was ultimately it was good for them um, because basically the career journey sort of started with me doing whatever Simon or Bryce didn't want to do um, and um, <laughs> and so that was fun as you do, um, as you do. yeah I mean they, they were, that was the first lesson in delegation I think I think there's a question yep. coming up about that shortly um, but uh, it was it, it was a lot of handing over of, of of things that they didn't necessarily want to do, but were the fundamentals of how to become a good uh, you know become a good leader and a good business owner and cool. how to run a good business. Um, yeah. And so, sort of the core tasks were really helping the salespeople understand the new world of database and and you know running yeah. you know how to how to how to provide great customer experience in a digital world. Um, yeah. And then uh, there was some branding and marketing, which um, I really enjoy, and um, and it's sort of a, a, a passion a passion point for me. And then um, really about trying to create a framework inside of the business where we could provide a better level of service, sure. um, so that old, our our customers could provide a better level level of service to their customers. Now, when you uh, bought into the business, mm. and you know, um, all acquisitions, mergers, doesn't matter who's. Mm new business owner, mm. it all doesn't go smooth. No, no. <laughs> so um, name a couple of instances where it didn't go smooth, but you turned it around. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a good question. Um, and that wasn't actually on the on the list of questions either, William. So, you know, that's, no, that's we, a tough one. We, no, we, we're sometimes right. we freelance. Here. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> Look, I think um, there's like a – I would say there's a three-second moment where when you stand up at a sales meeting and you're – you know, sort of, you say, you know, sort of say to the team, you know, this is what we want to do, and yeah. there's sort of that three second moment where you're looking at them, they're looking back at you, then they're looking at their colleagues, and then they're making a decision in that three second moment yeah. as to whether or not, you know, that's actually a good idea. And I think, um, in all honesty, I probably wasn't ready for, um, I probably wasn't ready for business ownership to start with, in particular when when Bryce. Um, you know, made the decision that he wanted to exit. It was probably a couple of years too early. Right. Um, and there were definitely a couple of people looking at each other going, jeepers, don't know about this. Um, and yeah. I think for me, I was incredibly grateful that um, that Simon was able, you know, Simon, um, who was early 60s um, by then, um you know, was was willing to give me a shot and to to hang in there as sort of the other business partner and and sort of go on a relatively risky journey. Sure. Um, but also to be able to provide that stability for the team while I was still, you know, I still had the training wheels on really um, mm. at that at that juncture. So, I think you know the first lesson for me is that you've got to create an environment whereby your 
um, if you're going through a succession planning process, the person who's supposed to be the the successor is actually ready. And there's a lot of things that we could have done, and and you know, in the years before before that, um, where we could have we could have made that succession plan go a little bit easier on everyone, okay. um, and uh, sort of make a make make for a slightly easier three second um, you know <laughs> moment. <laughs> where you got the court like with the the rabbits are caught with the the light, you know. The headlights in their eyes, sort of type <laughs> yeah. of thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, so I think for me that that's that's that was a really key learning from that from that period of time. And then I think the fundamentals about you know understanding that um, you know a a great team is built around a great culture, and a great culture is around yeah. around having mutual expectations of one another. And sure. I think one of the key mistakes that I learned. You know that I've learned, um, I've learned from, I guess, and has created an opportunity for us is really about digging in when you understand that the culture is not quite right, and sure. really digging right to the nth degree and making some brave decisions around aligning people um, and aligning their behaviour back to what's important for the team, or helping them understand that perhaps you know we might not be the place um, for them for the yep. betterment of everyone inside of the business. And, no, we got you there. Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, when you started, apart from Simon and Bryce, uh, who helped you the most in business? Yeah, I think um, I was really fortunate in Christchurch. Alison Aitken, who, was, oh, uh, yeah. who is still a great salesperson for Harcourts down there, yeah. um, and then another great friend of mine, Gail Hudson, who mm-hmm. I actually met doing my real estate agency licence um, up in Auckland, and she's become an amazing friend and, and mentor to me um, and has got a, you know, sort of, um, you know, now sort of just in the early stages of retirement, um, <laughs> but has got a work, e- you know, taught taught me about, you know, a, a good quality work ethic inside of real estate and, and being able to, um, you know, deal with the, um, I guess, the freedom of self-employment and sort of, you know, you still got to turn up and <laughs> and uh, do a full full day's work yeah. and, um, and uh, you know, no matter, you know, whether or not you've got someone, you know, expecting you to clock in at 8.30 or not, your customer no. still expects you to be, be there. So yeah. um, Gail was a great mentor to me to start with. Sure. And then, um, you know, Carol Petter, my, uh, you know, our external company accountant, who was actually Simon and Bryce's company accountant. Right. And, and she sort of, um, she she was a massive part of, um, you know, h- helping us get a budget, um, you know, and, and make some pretty big decisions um, along the way. And she sort of keeps me keeps me pretty accountable. <laughs> I know when I'm getting a call from Carol, it's, um, you know, pretty important. Um, and um, she probably finds me quite painful. At <laughs> I don't know. I, I always listen to the advice. I don't always take it. But um, but she's been an amazing, amazing mentor to me. And um, oh, I definitely great. wouldn't be here today without, without her. Um, what would you say is the um, the either the point of difference? Look, there's layers of difference between all other agencies, but mm. with Damarel Group, what would you say is be a major point of difference from all other agencies? I think the diversity of our leadership team. Um, we're, we're, we've got a um, we've got a leadership bench which is predominantly um, female led, which is uh, which is pretty cool, um, and I think that leads to some real diversity of thought. Um, you know, Simon and I as um, two sort of probably male males um, sort of leading the business, you know, um, to then be today where, you know, we've got a we've got a, a very strong female leadership bench mm-hmm. um, has has helped us make sub- significantly better leadership decisions um, as a team. Um, and I and I and I actually think that's pretty rare still inside of our industry um, mm-hmm. to have such a strong female bench um, sure. leadership bench. Um, and then I think you know the infrastructure and the layers of infrastructure where we provide quite a different level of service, whereby we separate out you know the role of our sales directors, yes. you know, into you know, and, and we help our compl- you know we create a framework where our compliance department provide high quality compliance advice, provides high quality compliance advice, sure, um, and then a, and then a specialist marketing team. Yeah. Um, I, I think that for us is yeah. uh, sort of those three key points of difference for us. Absolutely really crucial. Um, you obviously just stepped into from managing director, obviously into CEO now of the group. Mm. Um, what are the two challenges that you are facing now mm. going into the future? I think um, the way of the way the way people expect to be working um, has changed in the last two years, and. Mm-hmm. You know what? You know, in the past, I think people got a lot of value out of being inside of the office and having a lot of water cooler chat, um, and 
and learning from one another. But I think, you know, the challenge for us now is how do you create a framework whereby people actually quite enjoy working from home, mm. but they still want to be part of a high performing culture. They still want to have the water cooler chat. They still want to have the sense of belonging to an organization. And how I think the challenge for us is how do we, how do we create a sense of belonging whereby um, even if they're not coming into the office, every, if, if people aren't coming into the office every single day, how do we help people feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves or they're going on a journey with, with the organisation? And so yeah. I think that's probably the, 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 the main challenge that I'm sort of grappling with at the moment. And then secondly, I think, you know, our industry, you know, when I first started, I was pr- pretty, you know, I was probably, I was, well, I was one of the youngest um, to, to be in the mm-hmm. industry at the time. And... Um, and I think, you know, now we're really fortunate that we've got a real, you know, we've got quite a breadth of age demographic yeah. inside of our industry, that's which good. is really cool. But I think the next change, you know, that's coming is really about how do we make sure that um, the customer is nurtured um, for the period of time where they own a home and mm-hmm. they're provided with high quality advice and information for that period of what I would call passive enjoyment of the home that they're living in or the investment property that they yeah. own and then helping that. And 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 then and helping the salesperson keep in touch with them for that period of time until down the track they make the decision that they're going to sell. Um, sure. Because I, I think every other industry is sort of starting to clock that, and I think yeah. our real estate industry has got a long way to go yeah. um, around understanding what that really looks like. For sure. Um, when you stepped into the uh, obviously the CEO role or even managing director, um, name a, name one of your biggest mistakes that you made. And how you what you learnt? What was the learning from that? Because um, th- look, when people listen to our, um, the podcast and so forth, you're always looking to w- what's a little golden nugget that I need for my own personal yeah. life or business life. That's that's a good question, and you know it's really interesting because I'm a great consumer of content as well, and a great consumer of advice. I, I think I, I you know I'm always looking for those golden nuggets mm-hmm. as well. And I always, I've, I, I always underestimated the power of culture and the power of actually helping people go on a journey around understanding that if you know if they're acting out or they're not acting in alignment with our values, you know, then then you know they got two choices. They can either you know we can either help them go on that journey to align them back to what's important, or sure. we can exit them. And every bit of advice that I always had was. Um, you know, if if someone's not prepared to jump on board with where you're going as a team or or as a mm-hmm. as a broad culture, you know, it's it's better to exit them rather than worrying about the you know you know um, rather than having the revenue inside of your business. And and what we've found um, by by becoming consciously stronger about our expectations from a cultural perspective, yeah, is that actually performance performance has grown as a result as we've exited. Um, those people who aren't culturally yep. aligned, and it sounds awful, you know, and it's not great, and it's mm. you have sleepless nights as a business owner when you're thinking about those sort of things. But actually, you know, the biggest mistake I made was not having those expectations much more clearly defined a lot earlier in my career, um, and I actually think that's that held us back significantly for a number of years, yeah. and I and I just wish, you know. I, I hope the team who have been around for a while have seen that we've we've done that, um, and it's been good for every, everyone as a result. And I just hope, I, you know, I feel like it's unforgivable that I that I held on to that. You know, I, I held on to those people who were driving great revenue but weren't driving great cultural outcomes. Yeah. Um, and I and and I didn't and I wasn't strong enough as a leader at the time to, you know. To, to start asking deeper questions of myself, but also deeper questions of themselves, and also about what what we actually stood for as a team. Oh, that's good. That's good learning. Um, being a business owner too, you're a risk taker. Um, how do you mitigate the risk? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you are naturally a risk taker <laughs> when you own a business. Um, mm-hmm. And there's definitely been times. I was talking to a to, talking to the leader of a uh, really big um, real estate agency. Um, just the other day, and we were just reminiscing on March, you know, two years ago, and whether or not we actually sort of thought we had a business um, still. Yeah. And um, you know, so by definition, you are a risk taker. But I think that some of the mitigating factors are, are around making sure that we've got a great leadership bench, we've got a great team around us um, that gives you the confidence to, you know, go that next step. 
to make a decision to to take another office on um, to make that extra investment and in, you know another headcount in marketing or in compliance or, or or wherever it needs to be so that we can continue to you know grow you know the level of service that we're providing our team. Uh, one of the things I've observed about you is that you're not scared to delegate. So um, in order for a business to grow, you've got to be able to delegate. How do you let go? Because I know that you, huh? from just from observation, you're a very detailed person. Yeah. Or, almost down to the, the detail. Yeah. Minutely. Minutely. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, Jerica, um, uh, our chief marketing officer, when I <laughs> sort of, um, you know, we, we had a had a beer last night on, on um, you know, uh, at the end of work and I said, oh, I've got this podcast with William tomorrow and I r- sort of ripped through the questions with her and she said, "Oh, that delegation question—that'll be a tough one for you." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not—I'm not sure I've nailed it. Um, but um, yeah, it's a—it's a—it's a constant struggle because I do like to be in the detail because the detail is actually where the—that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Um, and you can have a disruptive idea all you like, but if you don't have the detail correct, then it's actually not going to—it's not going to hit in the way that it needs to for for your team. Um, and so. I think that's a work in progress, really. Um, and yeah. um, and I've I've over the years I've discovered that the better, the the deeper the investment you make in your leadership yeah. bench, um, and the stronger your leadership bench is, you know, the, the more comfortable I am at delegating. And so it's about for me, it's about bringing on a a, a players um, on sure. onto your leadership bench and. And then supporting them um, and being their biggest cheerleader in, in, in their lane, um, and I think we've managed definitely managed to do that um, in, in the last yeah. wee while. I, I mean, I, I just look at the impact. Um, you know, uh, you know, Jerick is having in our chief marketing officer lane, and it's amazing. And and clear, you know, operationally in the last twelve months, you know, um, alongside our sales directors and. And um, you know Belinda long term and yeah. and Louise long term and the and the finance department's been pretty amazing. So, you know I've had you know I've I've made in the past I've I've made those employment decisions where you think yeah look that'll we actually just need to get the work done here you know and that and but and and that's no disrespect to the person involved but i i i'm basically unable to work with people who aren't really 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 super good at their in, in their roles and and sure. and i think that that makes it easier for the person you're employing and it, and it makes it easier for me to be able to delegate so that um, sounds bloody awful doesn't it really? <laughs> <laughs> that's all that's all good that's all part of leadership yeah it's it all is. part of leadership yeah. um obviously you were coming back to culture you were concerned about the culture um, uh, how did you go about changing that? Um, I think the first step that we made was bringing on was was actually understanding that there were some things that I was never going to be great at. I'm actually not great at sales meetings. I'm actually not great first thing in the morning. Um, first thing in the morning for me is my time, but every sales meeting is at eight thirty. You know, eight thirty on a Tuesday or a Wednesday morning. It's not prime time for me. Like. <laughs> um, and so for me, it, it was about it, the. I think the first and the best step that we we ever took was bringing Belinda Henson into our business as a yeah. as a as a really strong sales director yes. um, on the team, and um, her nurturing style rubbed off some of the you know sharper edges to my personality, and and I learned mm-hmm. a lot from a lot from her, um, and I think we make a great team actually. So I, you know, for me, that it's was the good. first step. Um, and then I think you know what a bit of time um, also helps um, where you gain where you you gain the ability to make decisions which aren't solely financially driven after a period of time and 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 you get that luxury um, you know uh, and I and I think for me that 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 was sort of the other crucial part around um, around finally understanding that if I wanted to keep if if I was struggling to turn up to work and. I was struggling because of the culture, then other people were going to be struggling because of the culture and didn't matter how much money you made, you still wanted to enjoy if, – if I still wanted to, to enjoy turning sure. up to work, then we were going to have to make some changes. And I did really want to turn up to work because I, I quite enjoy working, you know. So Now, 
not Belinda Henson, but the Belinda that you're married to. Yep. Um, oh, the real what, boss. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is she? What's her support level with you? What does she think about you owning the business and so forth? Because she's got her own career path as yeah, well. Yeah, she does. Yeah, she's a, she's an amazing solicitor and um, mm. and and has 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 um, had an amazing career. Um, definitely way better solicitor than I was ever going to make. She's like a <laughs> like an A plus student. I was sort of like a C's get degrees sort of a guy, you know. Um, but I, um, I I mean I. I'm really fortunate that I now have the context about what a great what what a great home life looks like, and right. you know the life Belinda and I've been able to you know build for ourselves, and um, you know with our uh, growing family, um, you know it's been pretty cool, and um, and it's definitely made me a better person, and 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 you know I think it's made given me more context about you know actually people do need to leave work and go and look after the kids and and yeah. enjoy that. Yes. Um, and not being knackered from work, um, you know, and and um, to be able to actually do what life's all about, which is spend time with your family. Yeah, no, very um, good. And so I've learned a lot from her, um, and I wouldn't be able to do what I do now without yeah. her. Um, she carries the predominant parenting load um, in and amongst her busy career and, and, yeah. and also her wanting to live a life as well, which is kind of cool. But I think over the last couple of years we've managed to get a – a, a balance together, which um, which uh, we're both pretty proud of. So no, that's really good. No, really yeah. awesome to hear that. Yeah. Well, uh, that's uh, almost come now to the end of our session yeah, together right. today. Yeah. But Gal, I just <laughs> want to thank you for being on uh, Without Borders today, and thank you for those deep insights into how a business owner and CEO operates. I mean, we could have gone deeper, but uh, time won't allow 100%. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a privilege to uh, work with you over the last couple of years, and I am oh. incredibly proud to work with you and your team and um, and see the results that you achieve, um, oh, you. you know, all around Auckland. Um, it's pretty amazing. And, um, yeah, just want to thank you for your contribution to our team and to our culture over the last couple of years. I well, appreciate amazing. that very much. Thanks for listening to Without Borders and my special guest today. If you need help on your property journey or to be a guest on the podcast, I'd love to talk. Just get in touch at teamwilliamtartana.co.nz. Join me in another two weeks for another episode of Without Borders.